Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Walter Russell Mead is with us. Walter is one of our leading and most influential foreign policy thinkers. He has written five published books on American foreign relations, the latest of which carries the sizzling title of the Ark of a Covenant, the United States, Israel, and the fate of the Jewish people. He is a professor at Bard College, the Global View columnist at the Wall Street Journal, and I can tell you to paraphrase the old E.F. Hutton slogan, when Meade talks about American foreign policy, everyone listens. I'm really thrilled to welcome Walter Russell Meade to the program. It is great to be here. Just thank you for having me. Well, congratulations on many fronts, but congratulations on your book, and congratulations that the New York Times has uh, selected your book as one of the 100 notable books of 2022. And in the same group as poetry, fiction, memoirs, and there you are, Fate of the Jewish People, The Ark of a Covenant. There you go. Uh, I once had an intern who told me, Jews are news. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may be so. Uh, you, uh, when you think of uh, foreign policy now, you think immediately of Ukraine and China and Russia and Iran. Uh, Israel is kind of on a back burner these days. It's almost boring. Uh, <laughs> now your book comes out. But why did you decide to write this book? Well, because you know, there's a line in the book where I say, Israel occupies a speck on the map of the world, but a continent in the American mind. And if you want to understand how Americans think about foreign policy generally and kind of how public opinion and um, strategic interests in politics shape our foreign policy, it turns out that, a, that studying this little country and our relationship to it opens a lot of doors. Well, uh, let's start with uh, American Jews because everyone seems to blame Israel on American Jews. Uh, it's a trope. Uh, everyone seems to blame our foreign policy on uh, the Jewish lobby or American Jews. Uh, uh, Kennedy would from time to time speak of, of the Jews as kind of uh, the focus of an Irish politician. Someone named David uh, Chappelle, a comedian on Saturday Night Live, took some heat because he talked about the Jews running Hollywood. Now, are the Jews a team like the Carolina Panthers, <laughs> <laughs> that they have a sense of shared purpose? Right. And <laughs> Maybe like the Carolina Panthers in a really bad year. But, but, you know, I mean, there are rumors out there that Jews have a lot of different opinions and <laughs> points of view. And well, I that accounts say, for their unfortunate history. <laughs> right. Well, I, you know, I did at one point, I kind of half-jokingly suggested to the publisher that, that the subtitle should be, Don't Blame Israel on the Jews. Uh, because, in fact, um, actually, America has been less central to the story of Israel and its rise than most Americans think. And American Jews were less central in American policymaking toward Israel. Just to give you an example of how oddly it all works, the most important single thing that the U.S. ever did to promote the creation of the state of Israel was when we blocked immigration from Europe in 1924. That overnight closed the door on, on hundreds of thousands of Jewish immigrants who were coming in at that point. And for, prior to that time, of the millions of Jews who left Europe and especially Russia, over 90% came to the United States. The, most of the rest went to other countries like Canada or Australia. But and a, uh, sorry, uh, Argentina, and a very small percentage went to Palestine. You know, Palestine was malarial. <laughs> it was there were lots of people there who were trying to kill you. It was not a not a favorite spot. The land was arid. Yeah, exactly. No, it was. Uh, you know, it, there was really, an, and many of the Zionist pioneers who went there left because <laughs> it was it was so inhospitable. But. In the 1920s and 30s, one by one, the other country, the countries that Jews could go to closed their doors. And Palestine, by the 1930s, as, as advocates could say, is it's the only place on earth that wants Jews. So um, had the U.S. not blocked immigration, 
uh, there, there likely would never have been enough Jews in Palestine to form a state. And, I, and again, far from the American Jewish lobby engineering this as a way to get a state of Israel, American Jewish lobby was pretty strongly unanimously against immigration restrictions. On the other hand, at roughly the same time... Immigration to the United States. Yeah, immigration to the United States. They, you know, they wanted to keep the door open for Jewish immigration and other immigration. The, um, at the same time, Congress was debating whether the U.S. should endorse the Balfour Declaration, Britain's decision to build a Jewish, na allow the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine on captured Ottoman land after World War I. And the um, American Jewish community was actually bitterly divided over this. And the leadership of the American Jewish community and the most politically influential and the wealthiest American Jews were absolutely against the Balfour Declaration and against the whole Zionist project. Uh, Henry Morgenthau, the... Uh, the first. The first, the, who had been Wilson's ambassador to the Ottoman Empire and was the senior political figure among American Jews of the day and very wealthy guy, um, uh, organized, I think, 400 leading American Jews to sign a petition not to accept the Balfour Declaration. But now we're talking about, what, 1914? The, well, this is actually 19, 1920s, 1920s, early 1920s. But we're backing up. But that wasn't the, uh, the beginning of uh, American Zionism. Uh, we right. had something uh, called the Blackstone Memorial right. Right. in Again, 1891. American, Maybe you should talk yes. about that. No, <laughs> right. No, while American Jews are really squirm, don't like the idea of Zionism. In fact, the New York Times in the 19th century, when it was owned by Christians, was pro-Zionist. Jews bought the New York Times. It became anti-Zionist. It's an interesting well, it's flip. It's true with the Washington Post as well. Yeah, you know. Her in Vienna, Herzl's own newspaper uh, would not use the word Zionism until it was in his obituary. Herzl was the founder, founder of, Zionism. of Zionism, the Austrian Jewish Theodore founder Herzl. of Z Zionism. Yeah, uh, so two years before Herzl wrote his book, um, Der Judenstaat, the Jewish state, which is kind of the charter of the modern Zionist movement among West European Jews, uh, two years before then, President Benjamin Harrison is sitting peacefully in the White House, not bothering anybody, <laughs> when the Secretary of State comes in and hands him a petition uh, that asking him to help establish a Jewish state, use America's diplomatic influence and so on to establish a Jewish state in Palestine. This petition is signed by John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, a galaxy of journalistic, intellectual, religious, and political leaders of kind of the Anglo-Wasp establishment of the East Coast and the Middle West. Jews were <laughs> conspicuous by their absence from this declaration. Uh, so Zionism, the idea that there should be a Jewish state was solidly implanted in the American uh, establishment before the Zionist movement existed among European Jews. Uh, let's go back to uh, the founding of the Republic. Uh, there were Jews present uh, in the United States in 1776 and before. Uh, George Washington uh, had some ideas about the American Jewish mm -hmm. community. Maybe you can go into that. Yeah, this, is, this is, again, one of the astonishing things is that there's always been anti-Semitism in America, and what we've seen uh, recently at Mar-a-Lago and <laughs> some of the craziness that, that's going on is, is not a new phenomenon. We can talk about that if you want to, but at the same time, there's been this strong counter movement of an, a kind of an instinctive revulsion at anti-Semitism. Uh, Jews in America from colonial times felt that America was a better place for them to live than any of the European countries. Uh, you have K Jews were, there weren't very many, there were only about a thousand at the, in, in the U.S. at the time of the revolution, but they were accepted, they were often Sephardic Jews, 
Many of them were, um, had fled Brazil when the Portuguese, uh, Portuguese reconquered it from the Dutch in the 17th, 18th century, including the ones who came as refugees to New York that Peter Stuyvesant tried to get rid of. And they were very well integrated into the community and, and kind of accepted. They served on juries in some cases. Uh, but there was still a question, you know, the revolution comes. What is the attitude of the new country toward Jews going to be? And the, uh, in Truro, there was actually some talk of trying to get the, all the Jews in America to write a letter to George Washington. But again, Jew, the Jews did not agree. There were six synagogues in, in, the, in America, and they really could not get together on a program. Uh, but the synagogue in, in Newport, Truro, sent a, a letter asking Washington. Uh, this is Rhode Island. Yeah. What, so what's the situation going to be? And Washington says, basically, in this country, we no longer speak of toleration as if some Americans didn't have the same right to be here. Uh, everybody who obeys the law has a perfect right to be here, live, work, vote, do their own, do, do their own thing under their own vine and their own fig tree. And, uh, you know, and said, this is, you know, this is not just my personal view. This is, this is the nature of our institutions. And that, Interesting, that document was really not controversial at the time. This was how people felt. So there was this attitude toward Jews in America right from the beginning that, you know, to the present day, you know, in, in 2,500 years, I don't think you could find another country, another society where the diasporic Jews have had the same kind of ease of opportunity, of access, of integration that they enjoy in the, have enjoyed in the United States, especially really in the last two generations. So in America, we've had kind of a cross current of, of feeling, haven't we? We've had uh, uh, those that uh, believe that the Jews should be fully, uh, here I go with the Jews again, uh, integrated uh, into American life and culture as uh, undoubtedly they became and became entrenched in those that feel that somehow or other uh, there's something foreign about them, right. and, uh, something different about them, uh, and there's something that should be uprooted. And then layering on top of that is this uh, notion of a Jewish homeland, which didn't even start with George Washington. It started right. before that in America with right. Cotton Mather. I know. In, in the 17th century in Boston, these Puritan clergy are writing books that say, and the Bible tells us that sometime in the future, incredible as it may sound, impossible, God will call the scattered Jews of the earth back to the, the lands of the Bible. And this was um, generally speaking kind of Puritan English Reformation. You get a lot of this. John Milton wrote about it. Sir Isaac Newton wrote about it. But it took a particularly strong hold in the U.S. And it continues as a theological train of thought um, right on through. And it's not a fundamentalist thing or an evangelical thing. Um, it's something that you find in, well, certainly, you know, Rockefeller was no fundamentalist, John D. Rockefeller. Um, for many Americans, there was this idea that you look at the ancient world and you see these three great peoples, the Greeks, the Hebrews, the Romans, and you read their literature and it's full of heroes. They live in republics. They are virtuous. The land is beautiful. The people are prosperous. You know, the, the men are brave and the women are good looking or maybe vice versa, but it's just terrific. And you look at them now. Now, by now, I mean, say the early 19th century, the Greeks are under the Turks and Greece is miserable and poor. The Romans are under the popes and the Habsburgs and the Bourbons and Italy is a malarial sinkhole and it's unspeakably poor and the people are superstitious and no one is really talking about the Italians as models of courage and, and, and honesty the way the ancient Romans were. And then you look at the Jews, again, scattered through the earth, 
Palestine when, when Mark Twain visited, he said, it's the worst thing I've seen since Arizona. Uh, and this sense of <laughs> the people is, is in ruins and the land is in ruins, but not just for the Jews, for the Greeks and the Romans too. And Americans at this time had this maybe crazy idea that if these people would adapt American ideas, that the American ideals, self-government, honest hard work on the farm, equality, get rid of super, the power of superstitious states and separate church and state. You did all these things, then you would flourish. So when the Greeks rise up against the Ottoman Turks, Americans, including uh, Julia Ward Howe's future husband, go to Greece to fight for Greek freedom. It's, and there's a huge vogue, you know, fashion for the Greek freedom fighters. It's kind of like Ukraine today or something. Same thing with Italy. They actually offered Garibaldi a, a job as a general in the American Civil War, but people were so excited by the Italian Risorgimento. And they thought, okay, this can happen to the Jews too. If only they take up farming. Exactly. So you have Henry Ford, who a notorious anti-Semite, uh, who undoubtedly did not sign uh, the Blackstone <laughs> Memorial. But Henry Ford said, show me a Jewish farmer. Yeah. And then Zionism showed him a Jewish right. farmer. Well, actually, you can go to Jerusalem today and stay in the American Colony Hotel, which was originally found, Americans went over to Jerusalem to try to persuade the Jews to farm, I think 1860s, 70s and you know, drag them out into the hot sun. I don't want to be out here in the hot sun. I don't want to work on a farm. And the colony did not succeed, but it left a very nice hotel in its <laughs> wake. Um, but yeah, this I, so when you start getting the kibbutzes in Israel, you start getting the farmers. Captures the imagination. Well, and also the Americans aren't saying, oh, those Jews, they're now going to try to impose their agenda on us. They're saying, finally, the Jews have figured out what we've been telling them all along. The Jews are getting with the program. So there was a tremendous sense of vindication that a lot of Americans had. And then as, you know, as, as obviously it kind of worked, and so the Jews are, these farms are, you know, the land is blooming and the people are blooming. And then this despised group of people who everyone thinks is weak and no good, they're standing up for themselves and gaining respect. You see, for a lot of Americans, that was a sign American ideas work. Even the Jews, <laughs> if they buy into the American way of life, will be magnificent, free, strong people. I'm reminded of that photograph of uh, the couple uh, tilling the soil on the kibbutz and the uh, husband uh, has his plow, hand plow, and I don't know, maybe he's on a tractor, and the wife is following him and she has a rifle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Over his shoulder. <laughs> well, this, you know, a lot of Americans saw that and felt pretty good. But I think there's another level at which without which it's hard to understand the kind of American emotional attachment to, to Israel. Not that everybody feels it or feels it equally. And, but, you know, people will tell you who, who support, who's pro-Israel. Oh, it's the white evangelicals and the Jews. But if you look at the polls, about 14, 12 to 14 percent of America are white evangelicals. Black Hispanic evangelicals, a bit more. Um, and then about 2 percent are Jews. Well, 12 plus 2 is 14 percent. That's not, you know, you know, you look at polls, how many people are sympathetic for Israel, you get three and four and even five times that number. So it's not, that's not where it all is. So is there a Christian Zionist element that uh, is part of all this? Well, there, there has its origins in the Bible. There is. Um, but there's a, I would say there's a kind of, I would say there's a hard Christian Zionism, which is linked to very specific theological interpretations, but there's a soft Christian Zionism. And maybe the best way to describe this is you think about, think about the situation of people in, in the late, in the mid to late 1940s, 1944, Soviet troops break into Poland and they start liberating the camps. And you see, you know, there'd been stories about the Holocaust, there was knowledge, but now you're seeing, you know, newsreel footage and you're seeing pictures and you're hearing from survivors. 
what this is telling you, you know, in a, in a civilization that kind of thought that the Enlightenment was putting us all on a new path, that science and technology and culture were going to cure the dark stain inside human nature. And so we would get, we would be better people uh, because of the Enlightenment. And that's, that's our faith in progress, is we're, we're morally better than our ancestors. Well, Germany was the most enlightened country, you know, Goethe, Schiller, Hegel, the philosophy, the music, and you know, this society produces, you know, a crime that would have shocked Attila the Hun. And your faith in the human nature and the, and the possibility of a kind of good society is really takes a knock. The next year, 45, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so this unreformed bestial animal capable of the most unbelievable crimes and of the greatest stupidities now has the power to wipe out all life on Earth. Let's just uh, talk uh, for a moment about this transformation of Israel because you talk about Israel in the 1940s and the 1950s. That's the kibbutz and that's right. the ideals and uh, that's the fulfillment of the biblical promise, the right, land right. of milk and honey. And, and then uh, you find uh, Israel today armed to the teeth, independent of the United States, paying more or less their fair share of, uh, of, of their defense and security. Uh, developed a nuclear bomb and uh, uh, strutting and fretting their hour upon the right, stage. Right. Uh, Netanyahu is back. And uh, now there's a whole strain of American political thought that finds this quite appealing. They like the Iron Fist. I right. mean, you talked about Hiroshima. Jackson, right. Colin Powell, uh, a devastating force, uh, is uh, the only way to wage war. And uh, Right? No, very much. Uh, so it's, it's, things have changed greatly, but, haven't they? Yeah. But again, we start with this moment, 1948, Israel appears. And it's like, okay, we have Hiroshima. We have, you know, the Holocaust. And now here's Israel. It's a sign, you know, just like the preacher told me when I was a kid, that someday the Jews would return. It was a sign to a lot of people. This is the soft Christian Zionism that that somehow the big guy upstairs is still in charge. That in this chaotic history, communism, Nazism, nuclear weapons, there's still something, there, there is a there there, there's a guide, there's a force. That I think becomes, and, and people like Billy Graham in their preaching really highlight we're at the end of the world and Israel is here. Not again with some specific like, you know, rapture or these sorts of specific scenarios of the end, but just to capture this sense. Now, with Israel, as you say, strong and powerful, um, it's, it's created this odd thing. In the 1950s, when Israel was weak, it was the darling of the left and people People younger than you and me don't necessarily remember this, but in the 1950s, Israel was a great left-wing cause. The Democratic Socialists of America used to identify Israel as the poster child for socialism because, you know, everybody say, well, you know, socialism, no one will be free. They say, look at Israel, <laughs> which was far more socialist in the 50s than any of the West European social democracies. And they've got free elections. And they say, well, but socialism can't build a strong economy. Well, look at Israel. They're filling all these, they're taking in all these immigrants and refugees, and they have a strong national defense. Socialism works. Uh, Until it didn't. Well, and then, you know, and that broke a lot of hearts, I think, when <laughs> the Israelis moved to the right in the 1970s. Okay, well, uh, sadly, we've run out of time because this has been a delightful and fascinating discussion. <laughs> but then we can talk about preachers uh, from Cotton Mather uh, to uh, Malcolm X. But uh, the, uh, I have a question for you, uh, Walter Russell Mead, and my question is, uh, should we blame Israel on the Jews? Obviously, this, you know, they once asked Robert E. Lee, you know, or he heard some people arguing about, you know, why the South lost the Civil War. And we said, well, it was the tariffs and it was the, 
It was the factories and all this. And Lee says, you know, I always thought the Yankees had something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to say that I think, you know, the Zionists had, had a lot to do with it. Mm. Without the Zionists, there would be no state of Israel. But the Zionists did not sort of say, ah, we're going to mobilize the secret Jewish power that rules the world and we'll force them to give us a state. That runs Hollywood. Right, right. You know, runs Hollywood, runs and, the banks. And, and the State Department. <laughs> right. The State Department, the Jews had very little success. But, you know, one weird thing is the U.S. has actually spent more money and more diplomatic capital to build a Palestinian state than it ever did to build a Jewish state. That if you, if you compare U.S. attitudes toward the Palestinian national movement after 48 and the Zionist movement before 48. The, you should be asking, who's the Palestinian lobby <laughs> if you want to have conspiracy theories in American politics? So can we blame Palestinians on the Arabs? But in any event, that's another subject that's, for another That's time. a whole other subject. But and yet. so I, I have to thank you for coming by and thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. Meanwhile, take care, be well and all the best.